Chapter 13 Contract of Bailment and Contract of Pledge The word bailment is derived from French word bailier which means to deliver. Section 148 defines bailment as the delivery of goods by one person to another for some purpose upon a contract that they shall when the purpose is accomplished be returned or otherwise disposed as per the instructions of the person delivering them. The person delivering the goods is called bailer and the person to whom they are delivered is called bailey. Essential elements of bailment. First, contract. A bailment is usually created by agreement between the bailer and the bailey. The agreement may be expressed or implied in certain exceptional cases. Bailment is implied by law as between finder of goods and the owner. Second, delivery of possession. A bailment necessarily involves delivery of possession of goods by bailer to bailey. Delivery of possession may be actual or constructive or symbolic delivery may be made by doing something which has the effect of putting the goods in the possession of the intended bailey or any person authorized to hold them on his behalf. Section 149 Note Mere custody of goods does not create relationship of bailer and bailey. Third, for some purpose, the delivery of goods from bailer to bailey must be for some purpose. If goods are delivered by mistake to a person, there is no bailment. Fourth, Return of specific goods. It is agreed between the bailer and the bailey that as soon as the purpose is achieved, the goods shall be returned or disposed of according to the directions of the bailer. Classification of bailment. First, gracious bailment. It is a bailment where no consideration passes between the bailer and the bailey. Second, non gracious bailment or bailment for reward. It is a bailment where consideration passes between the bailer and the bailey. Duties and rights of bailer and bailey. Duties of bailer. First, to disclose known faults. It is the first and foremost duty of the bailer to disclose the known faults about the goods bailed to the bailey. If he does not make such disclosure, he is responsible for any damage caused to the bailey directly from such faults. Section 150 Note In gracious bailment, however, the bailer is responsible only for those faults which are known to him and which are not disclosed. Second, to bear extraordinary expenses of bailment. The bailey is bound to bear ordinary and reasonable expenses of the bailment. But for any extraordinary expenses, the bailer is responsible. The bailer must repay to the bailey all necessary expenses incurred by him for the purpose of the bailment. Section 158. Third, to indemnify bailey for loss in case of premature termination of gracious bailment. A gracious bailment can be terminated by the bailer at any time even though the bailment was for a specified time or purpose. But in such a case, the loss accruing to the bailey from such premature termination should not exceed the benefit he has derived out of the bailment. If the loss exceeds the benefit, the bailer shall have to indemnify the bailey. Section 159. Fourth, to receive back the goods. It is the duty of the bailer to receive back the goods when the bailey returns them after the expiry of the term of the bailment or when the purpose of which the bailment was created has been accomplished. If the bailer refuses to receive back the goods, the bailey is entitled to receive the compensation from the bailer for the necessary expenses of custody. Fifth, to indemnify the bailey, where the title of the bailer to the goods is defective and the bailey suffers as a consequence, the bailer is responsible to the bailey for any loss which the bailey may sustain by reason that the bailer was not entitled to make bailment or to receive back the goods or to give the direction respecting them. 
Section 164 Duties of Bailey First, to take reasonable care of the goods bailed. In all cases of bailment, the bailey is bound to take as much care of the goods bailed to him as a man of ordinary prudence would, under similar circumstances, take of his own goods of the same bulk, quantity and value as the goods bailed. Section 151 Second, not to make any unauthorized use of the goods. If the bailey uses the goods bailed in a manner which is inconsistent with the terms of the contract, he shall be liable for any loss even though he is not guilty of negligence and even if the damages is the result of an accident. Section 154 Third, not to mix the goods bailed with his own goods. The bailey must not mix the goods of the bailer with his own goods, but must keep them separate from his own goods. If he mixes the bailer's goods with his own goods, then A. With the bailer's consent, both shall have a proportionate interest in the mixture thus produced. Section 155 B. Without the bailer's consent, and if the goods can be separated, or divided, the bailey is bound to bear the expenses of separation as well as the damage arising from the mixture. Section 156 C. Without the bailer's consent, so that the mixture is beyond separation, the bailer is entitled to be compensated by the bailey for the loss of the goods. Fourth, to return any accretion to the goods. In the absence of any contract to the contrary, the bailey is bound to deliver to the bailer, or according to his directions, any increase of profit which may have accrued from the goods bailed. Section 163 Fifth, to return the goods. It is the duty of the bailey to return or deliver according to the bailer's directions the goods bailed without demand as soon as the time for which they were bailed has expired or for the purpose for which they were bailed has been accomplished. Section 160. If he fails to do so, he is responsible to the bailer for any loss. Section 161. Rights of the bailer. First, enforcement of rights. The bailer can enforce by suit all the liabilities or duties of the bailey as his rights. Second, Avoidance of the contract. The bailer can terminate the bailment if the bailey does, with regard to the goods bailed, any act which is inconsistent with the terms of the bailment. Section 153. Third, return of the goods lent graciously. When the goods are lent graciously, the bailer can demand their return whenever he pleases, even though he lent them for a specified time or purposes. But if the bailey suffers any loss exceeding the benefits actually derived by him from the use of goods because of premature return of goods, the bailer shall have to indemnify the bailey. Section 159. Fourth, compensation from a wrongdoer. If the third person wrongfully deprives the bailey of the use of possession of goods bailed, or does them any injury. The bailer or the bailey may bring a suit against the third person for such deprivation or injury. Section 180 Rights of bailey The duties of the bailer are the rights of bailey. As such, the bailey can, by suit, enforce the duties of the bailer. The other rights of the bailey are as follows. First, delivery of goods to one of the several joint bailers of goods. If several joint owners of goods bail them, the bailey may deliver them back to or according to the directions of one joint owner without the consent of all, in the absence of any agreement to the contrary. Section 165 Second, delivery of goods to the bailer without title. If the bailer has no title to the goods, and the bailey, in good faith, delivers them back to or according to the directions of the bailer. The bailey is not responsible 
to the owner in respect of such delivery. Section 166. Third, right to apply to court to stop delivery. If a person other than the bailer claim goods bailed, the bailee may apply to the court to stop the delivery of the goods to the bailer and to decide the title of the goods. Section 167. Fourth, right of action against free passers. If a third person wrongfully deprives the bailee of the use or possession of the goods bailed to him, he has the right to bring an action against the party. The bailer can also bring a suit in respect of goods bailed. Section 180. Fifth, bailee's lien. Where the lawful charges of the bailee in respect of the goods bailed are not paid, he may retain the goods. The right of bailee to retain the goods is known as particular lien. Law relating to lien. Lien means the right of a person to retain the possession of some goods belonging to another until some debt or claim of the person in possession is satisfied. Right of lien may arise a. by statute b. by express or implied contract c. by general course of dealing between the parties in a particular trade. A lien may be classified into two types. First, Particular lien. A particular lien is one which is available to the bailey against only those goods in respect of which he has rendered some service involving the exercise of labor or skill. Section 170 explain particular lien as follows. Where the bailey has, in accordance with the purpose of the bailment, rendered any service involving the exercise of labor or skill. In respect of the goods bailed, he has, in the absence of contract to the contrary, a right to retain such goods until he receives due remuneration for the services he has rendered in respect of them. Second, General Lien. A general lien is a right to retain all the goods or any property which is in the possession of the holder of another until all the claims of the holder are satisfied. This is a right to retain the property of another for a general balance of account. General lien, according to section 171, is available to bankers, factors, warfingers, attorney of high court and policy brokers. These persons are entitled in the absence of contract to the contrary to retain the possession of the goods paid to them as a security until their claims are fully satisfied. Distinction between Bailey's particular and general lien. Basis of distinction. First, nature of right. Particular lien gives the right to retain only such goods in respect of the charges due remain unpaid. General lien gives the right to retain any goods belonging to another person or any amount due from him. Second, conditions for exercising lien. Particular lien can be exercised only when some labor or skill has been expended on the goods, resulting in the increase in the value of goods. General lien may be exercised even though no labor or skill has been expended on the goods. Third, right to whom? Every bailey is entitled to particular lien. General lien can be exercised only by such persons as are specified under section 171. For example, bankers, factors, warfingers, attorney of high court, policy brokers, etc. Any other bailey may exercise general lien if there is an agreement to this effect. Finder of goods. A person who finds the good is not under the legal obligation to pick the goods, but if he does pick it up, he becomes a bailey. Section 71 clearly lays down that a person who finds goods belonging to another and takes them into his custody he is subject to the same responsibility as a bailey. Rights of finder of goods First, right of lien. A finder of goods has a right of lien 
over the goods of his expenses. As such, he can retain the goods against the owner until he receives compensation for trouble and expense incurred in preserving the goods and finding out the owner. But he has no right to sue the owner for any such compensation as the trouble and expense were incurred by him voluntarily. Section 168 Second, right to sue for reward. The finder can sue for any specific reward which the owner has offered for the return of the goods. He may also retain the goods until he receives the reward. Section 168 Third, right of sale. A finder of goods may sell the goods found. A. If the owner cannot with reasonable diligence be found. Or B. If found, he refuses to pay the lawful charges of the finder. Or C. If the goods are in the danger of perishing or losing the greater part of their value. Or D. If the lawful charges of the finder in respect of the goods found amounts to two-third of their value. Section 169 Obligations of finder of goods First, he must take reasonable care of the goods. In spite of this, the goods are destroyed. He is not responsible for any loss. Second, he must not use the goods his own purpose. Third, he must not mix the goods with his own goods. Fourth, he must try to find out owner of the goods. If he does do that, he will be liable as a tree passer. One who interferes with another's property. Termination of bailment. A contract of bailment is terminated in the following cases. First, on the expiry of the period. When the bailment is for a specific period, it terminates on the expiry of that period. Second, on the achievement of the object. When the bailment is for a specific purpose, it terminates as soon as the purpose is achieved. Third, inconsistent use of goods. When a bailee uses the goods in a manner inconsistent with the terms of the contract, the bailment terminates. Section 154. Fourth, destruction of the subject matter. A bailment is terminated when the subject matter of the bailment A is destroyed or B by reason of a change in its nature, becomes incapable of use for the purpose of bailment. Fifth, gracious bailment. It can be terminated any time subject to condition laid down in it. Sixth, death of the bailer or bailee. A gracious bailment is terminated by the death either of the bailer or bailee. Section 162. Pledge. The bailment of goods as security for payment of a debt or performance of a promise is called pledge. The bailer is, in this case, called pledger or pawner and the bailee is called pledgy or pawnee. Section 172. A pledge is a bailment for security. It is a special kind of bailment having all the characteristics of bailment. Difference between pledge and bailment. First, pledge is a bailment of good security for the performance of a specific promise. Bailment, on the other hand, is for the purpose of any kind. Second, in case of default by the pawner to repay the debt, the pawnee may, after giving notice to the pawner, sell the goods pledged with him. The bailee may either retain the goods or sue for his charges. Third, in case of pledge, the pawnee has no right to use the goods pledged with him. In case of bailment, the bailee may do so if the terms of the bailment so provide. The very fact in the case of pledge, the bailment of goods used as security does not entitle him to use the goods. Rights and Duties of Pawner and Pawnee The rights and duties of pawner and pawnee are almost similar to that of bailer and bailey, but the rights of pawnee and pawner need a special mention. Rights of pawnee First, right of retainer. The pawnee may retain the goods pledged until his dues are paid. He may retain them only for the payment of the debt or for performance of the promise. 
section 173 taken however exercise only a particular lien over the goods second right of retainer for subsequent advances when the pony lends money to same pawner after the date of the pledge it is presumed that right of retainer over the pledged goods extends to subsequent advances also section 174 third right to extraordinary expenses the pony is entitled to receive from the pawner extraordinary expenses incurred by him for the preservation of the goods pledged section 175 for such expenses he has no right to retain the goods he can only sue to recover them fourth right against the true owner when the pawner's title is defective when the pawner has obtained possession of the goods pledged by him under avoidable contract that is by fraud undue influence portion etc but the contract has not been resigned at the time of pledge the pony acquires a good title to the goods provided he acts in good faith and without notice of the pawner's defect of title section 178a fifth pawner's right where the pawner makes default section 176 where the pawner fails to redeem his pledge the pawning can exercise the following rights a he may file a suit against the pawner upon the debt or promise and may retain the goods pledged as collateral security b he may sell the goods pledged after giving pawner a reasonable notice of the sale c he can recover from the pawner any deficiency arising on the sale of the goods by him but he shall have to hand over the surplus if any realized on the sale of goods to the pawner rights of pawner first right to get back goods on the performance of promise or repayment of the loan and interest if any the pawner is entitled to get back the goods pledged second right to redeem debt in a case if the pawner makes default in the payment of the debt or performance of the promise at stipulated time he may still redeem the goods pledged at any subsequent time before the actual sale of them but he must in that case pay in addition any expenses which have arisen from his default section 177 third preservation and maintenance of the goods the pawner has a right to see that the pony like daily and preserves the goods pledged and properly maintains them fourth right of an ordinary debtor a pawner has in addition to the above rights the rights of an ordinary debtor which are conferred on him by various statutes meant for the protection of the debtor pledged by non-owners the general rule is that it is the owner who can ordinarily create a valid pledge but in the following cases even a non-owner can create a valid pledge first pledge by mercantile agent where a mercantile agent is with the consent of the owner in the possession of the goods or the documents of title to goods any pledge made by him when acting in the ordinary course of the business of a mercantile agent is as valid as if he were expressly authorized by the owner of the goods to make the same but the pledge is valid only if the pony acts in good faith and has not at the time of the pledge notice that the pawner has not the authority to pledge section 178 second pledge by seller or buyer in position after sale the seller left in the position of the goods after sale and a buyer who obtains the position of the goods with the consent of the seller before sale can create a valid pledge provided the pony acts in good faith and no notice of the previous sale of goods to the buyer or the lien of the seller over the goods section 30 of sale of goods act third pledge by co-owner in position one of the several co-owners of goods in position thereof with the assent of the other co-owners may create a valid pledge of the goods both pledge by person in position under avoidable contract a person obtain possession of goods under avoidable contract the pledge created by him 
is valid provided first the contract has not been rescinded before the contract of pledge and second the pony acts in good faith and without notice of the pawner's defect of title section 178a